Ah, we're back to five shows a week. We got ice and fire picks for 2020 on today's show. Do not miss it. It's been said that the foolish man built his house upon the sand and the wise man built his house upon the rock. Well, the wise fantasy football player builds their house upon the ultimate draft kit from the fantasy footballers. Full projections, video profiles, tier breakdowns, risk ratings, while you watch other teams comically topple over like a clown with poor balance. Your foundation for an incredible season will be solidified. You are the mighty Redwood. Your opponents are one-ply toilet paper. You are iron alloyed with carbon. Your opponents are a soggy leaf of lettuce. Go to www.ultimatedraftkit.com and get out of the sand today. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Woo! Woo! Feels a little different, doesn't it? I'm supposed to be sleeping. <laughs> no, is that why? <laughs> That's why I feel. I was saying it felt a little different because, like, the season, it's August, the season's oh, on no. the way, five days a week. Yours is more related to your. Uh, yes. Is that circadian rhythms? Is that your sleep cycle? Look, that I sounds good. I don't know. Monday, August 3rd. Those are those really loud bugs in my trees right Cicadas, now. Cicadas, yeah. You're the rhythms of the bugs. Uh, that's that's a good start. <laughs> Welcome into the podcast. Mike, the fantasy hitman, right? Jason Moore. I'm Andy Holloway. And we are the fantasy footballers. And we are now and into eternity, Whew. five days a week. It's go yeah, time. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Very exciting. We have uh, the greatest show of all time today. Uh, a very special drop returns, mm. and we have news to get into. A great, spectacular, quick question to talk about. But the big announcement, the thing that we really got to get out there, that people, they wait all year long for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> Jared Goff's here with an announcement. <laughs> come on, come on. Hear the, ye, hear ye. The Listener League, we are taking applications. For one week. Mm, we are one accepting week only. entries for the Listener League. And here is how you enter. And I'm saying this on the show, which means if you email and say, how do you enter? You have disqualified yourself from entering because this is competitive. And yeah. I, we, we don't take no, mm -mm. no guff. No fluff, right? no cuff. No, no fluff, no guff, no right. coconuts. That's Whatever. what we always say. No guff. I, I, that's what I define as email. Yeah, see, we're not taking any guff here, and, see. And now I'm burying the application <laughs> process. Listener League at fantasyfootballers.com. Speak for a moment about what we're looking for. Uh, we are looking for someone who is fun, awesome, and has done something <laughs> that no will impress us. With no guff, and that's <laughs> that's probably the most important part. Here's what we're not looking for. An email where you write a paragraph saying why you're good at fantasy football or why you love the show or whatever. We have so many entries that are coming in, and, you know, make, make, make a... We don't make like a, to read. Make a funny video. Yeah, exactly. Not a lot. <laughs> not, uh, you know, make a funny video or, or, or a song or something we've never seen. I mean, the, the options are truly We generally infinite. say impress us. Yes, just or impress su us. Surprise us, impress us. Don't tell us how good you are at fantasy football. No trophy cases, no guff, just something special. And we have to remind the listeners out there, we've got a couple people in already. That's mm -hmm. right. Because we had some ultimate draft kit giveaways. We also had the winner of the Megalobowl winner. The Megalobowl. And the three of us. Correct. First, second, and third place we are every in, year. Right, that's right. And uh, yes, we're accepting entries for one week. Listener League at FantasyFootballers.com. Piece of show trivia. We actually met Brooks, our fearless producer, through a Listener League entry. So you can be like Brooks. And you Bro could, you, I want to say this. 
zero percent guff on that, that side. Was of, no yes. guff. There I was, mean, yes. it was it was a really Guff-free. guffless video. Oh yes, and yes. I remember us huddling around and talking about it. Like, There's no look, guff here at all. Look for guff. I look went over guff. it like the Zapruder film, looking for guff. I mean, we were all waiting for Guffman, but it didn't come. <laughs> no. Oh. N- Oh, that no. was no. That's great. Thank you. That is great. I, I was having that. And listener Brian League. Catron, oh. the giant loser who does yes. some video work, also through the listener league. Yeah. Well, because we di- we will get guff out there to them. Like mm-hmm. we give Brooks yeah, a lot yeah. of guff. Yes. yes. We give Catron a lot of guff, but we did. You know. <laughs> just impress us. Yeah. Oh. And you can be a part of the official fantasy footballers listener league this year, 2020. It'll be fun. Uh, Twitter at the FF Ballers. If you want to follow us on socials, Instagram.com slash fantasy footballers, YouTube.com slash the fantasy footballers. We had so much fun with the live streams last week. I, I have no doubt there will be more this year than ever before. That was almost too easy. Yeah, we didn't yeah, we great. didn't set up these fancy home studios for nothing. <laughs> we're we're gonna get our use out of them this yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. Had nothing to do with current events at all. Yeah. It was about live streams. Listen. Quick question of the day. Which Steelers player are you most likely to draft? Mm-mm. So this is a uh, what looks to be a team ADP pick em quick question. This, Maybe we'll do some other teams is what I'm thinking. Yeah, that's, that's not a bad idea. This question made me realize how anti-Steelers I am in fantasy football this year. Just you know, I didn't think I can was. I, can I read the ADPs out? Please and then you do. can make a decision? Yes. Big Ben in the 11th round. James Conner, the top of the fourth. Juju, the back of the third. Deontay Johnson, 10th round. Eric Ebron, 13th round. Chase Claypool and James Washington, both undrafted. Who are you most likely to draft? For me, I think it's the 10th round Deontay Johnson shot. Sure. I, I, you, you want upside. There are a lot of metrics that show he was great if the offense gets back on track. We've seen Big Ben be able to support a wide receiver too. Doesn't cost you anything. Tenth rounder, that's where you're looking for upside. I, I don't could mind be the that one. Pick. Yeah, it could be the one. I don't. Yeah, sure. He, he definitely. Um, I, I don't. I don't mind that pick. You look at the the value difference between a third round Juju and then you're saying could Deontay could be the one. I don't see it that way. Sure. I probably won't draft him. Um, but certainly a worthy pick. The true answer is probably Big Ben because late round quarterbacks when you're playing you know dancing with the devil seeing how long you could wait right. and then everyone's gone i'm still like big ben's there i'm fine with that yeah, and he could be top three he's done it before but as far as you know the i, I think kind of the spirit of the question of you know what what player do i do i really look at in a draft right now is james connor i don't love a fourth round value you know he's he's alongside other players that i think it's it's very difficult to draft him, but I'm warming on him more and more in in the sense that all he's done when he's been on the field is be not good for fantasy, but great for fantasy. Um, the injury concerns are real. He was never able to stay on the field last season, but you know we've had plenty of examples of guys who go through rough injury stretches, and we just put that label on them, and then they're healthy. And then they're not, you know, Frank Gore once upon a time was a huge injury risk. He'll never that, get it that together. That one's insane. It is. At the beginning of he his wa- career. And he was. He, he was injury prone. You couldn't, yeah. you couldn't talk about Frank Gore without talking about, well, you're not going to get 16. And then he became well, the, two- <laughs> the Iron Man. <laughs> yeah. And Connor, like you said, when he's on the field, he's been great. They don't have a financial commitment to him long term. And they don't have, you know, there's been plenty of examples of players staying injury prone. So, uh, but the, the, the cost isn't so bad. 403. I mean, if he's on the field. He's so much better than the other options that they have right now. Was Mike, he a Mike, first what do you think? Rounder last year. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He. I mean, he it, was it, like a top eight pick. And if last you're looking year. at running backs, you're taking in the fourth of like, if if this player hits their ceiling, you know, and, or I should say the probability of them hitting a ceiling and being a top twelve runner, I would put the odds on James Conner. The guy's going there. For me, though, it it is it's probably Deontay Johnson of what what he could become. He was pretty solid. I'm not. I'm not nearly as in as uh, you know. Like uh, Twitter loves Deontay Johnson. Like he's been an off season hero, and I see it. I'm not as sure as everybody else is because James Washington was still was was still pretty productive as well with with the situation that they were given. So it, 
but I'm loading. I'm getting the running backs early. It would be a people, weird situation for me to grab Connor. People being on board him. with Deontay Johnson is super annoying because it, it makes you. Because it, it, I mean, it, it's it's good, but then when when like fantasy Twitter likes a guy, all of a sudden even my Mike Wright uh, contrarian genes will come active. That's like, right. well, I don't want to be part of the the mob that loves you know Deontay Johnson, but. Independent of all of that, like I, I, his ADP is still the tenth round. That's why I had to get in on, on uh, Jarwin early. Yeah, because the mob is forming. Because I didn't. Feel there like... are literally dozens of people. Yes, behind me right now. Yeah, which I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> a lot of people. All right, let's get into the news. News and notes from around the league. All right, first bit of news is I bought Jason a present. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I'm going to show it to the camera here. It's a very, very, where am I looking? Okay, there it is. It's a beautiful, spectacular, very, very red. It is very uh, red. Ronald, Ronald Jones, Jones shirt. So very nice. welcome to the party. I'll have to wear this soon. Now, of course, when you bought this, you didn't know the massive uh, news Uh oh. that he's not, I mean, he's not the vet anymore right he's not the, he is oh, not the did season something vet. happen yeah the slippery fish remember <laughs> remember that nickname Le yes LaShawn mccoy has signed with the tampa bay buccaneers i had to get you that shirt as fast as i possibly could one year uh one million dollar yeah. contract yeah. no money no money i i think people react completely differently to this news more than more people than I expected reacted with great trepidation and fear for Ronald Jones and Keyshawn Vaughn. Almost like they did last year when he arrived in Kansas City for Damian Williams and company. I just don't know how much LaShawn McCoy really has left. If you look at the numbers, what he actually did on the field in the limited time he had last year, he was actually good. Yes. But, uh, you know, Kansas City, Different story. I, I just don't know how much I'm making of this. How are you applying it to the Ronald Jones projections? Uh, it's for for me. I didn't move Ronald Jones, uh, Ronald Jones, Ronald Jones down at all. But it's it's at least a red flag that like where Jones seemed really secure as a great pick at his ADP. You at least have to go. Uh, well, it is in the realm of possibilities here that Lashawn McCoy is on the field more than you think. Bruce Arians loves veterans. Loves veterans. Uh, this isn't changing my outlook, though, greatly at this moment for Jones or Vaughn. I still like drafting both of those guys for what they could become in the system. It's a veteran but, It's a veteran team. Right. Right? So, like, you know, <clears throat> Tom Brady likes experienced players around him. Tom Brady takes a couple of hits. Ronald Jones is going to be off the field. Having a player like Shady, that would be the, you know, Rob Gronkowski coming exactly. back. Exactly. That that would be the concern for me. Yeah, the the nice thing when I when I plugged in LaShawn McCoy into this offense and took a look at where I think he fits, uh, the nice thing as far as him not affecting Ronald Jones that much is Dare Agunbowale. That's the player I think he's replacing because he's not good at all. And he was on the field over a quarter of the snaps every single game last I mean, he was involved. He was their pass catching specialist, if you will. And now you you have someone in here that's very experienced, can do more in that role. Um so I, I think that it will be a three man race and 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 it was last year as well, but Dare is the one that will lose out the most. Yeah, and it, you know, for many of these situations it's a camp watch. I mean, just see Who's taking reps once they're on the field and whether LaShawn McCoy stays around, yep. whether Keyshawn Vaughn gets opportunities or not. I mean, Arians loves veterans. Yes. Kind of doesn't like rookies. So, something to watch. Henry Ruggs says he's fully recovered from the thigh injury. Number one wide receiver off the board in the NFL draft. Oakland Raider, Henry Ruggs. Las Vegas Raiders. Oh, my Ooh. gosh. Oh, preseason oh, form, Andy. Wow. Goodness gracious. We don't take that guff around here, man. <laughs> that, that was so... <laughs> <laughs> the amount of guff. I thought this show had 0% oh. guff. It's got like 20% now. Jarvis Landry on the active PUP list. Jason, you've talked quite a bit about whether or not you know Jarvis is going to be ready to go to start the season. So far, not ready to go. Yeah, I mean, his timeline says he should be okay by the... I mean, I, nobody expected him to be good now, but the expectation is that he will be good by week one. But 
that's usually when I'm, you know, over the last couple of years, don't buy the injury dip. If someone is struggling to be there by week one, it's not this magical pill that's like the, you know, well, I wasn't okay, but there's a game you now. You went from so zero I'm, to a hundred in it overnight. I'm totally fine. Uh, yeah, which I think is good news for uh, the Odell Beckham owners out there and the health and the hopeful bounce back season. I, I think Odell's going to bounce back this season. I would rather have Jarvis Landry on the field for Odell Beckham's bounce back opportunities, personally. But, really? Yeah. yeah. Because of coverage? Yeah, because it, Baker Mayfield has shown that when he has to force the ball into a location, it has not produced good results historically. They had to do that a lot with Odell last year, and we can blame Odell's injury, but I don't blame Odell's injury for the balls flying eight, nine feet over his head, and they felt like they had to manufacture targets for him. So I guess I just wanted it to come naturally. Sure. But Evan Ingram avoided the PUP to start camp, which is um, that's impressive. Some, that's something for him. So that's it, good news. Yeah, it's great news. He's healthy now. Um, I believe that is because there has not been football being played, but as soon as football is played, we'll see. Most shows would not report this as news, but we're not most shows. Raiders have signed running back Jeremy Hill. <laughs> So I'm looking at you, Mike. Look, adjust that goes your back rankings. To like year one. Adjust your rankings appropriately. Josh Jacobs, look out. <laughs> uh, if you don't remember Jeremy Hill, I'm not surprised. But Jeremy Hill was once tattooed on Mike's back. Mm -hmm. Chest. 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 Yeah. Sorry. But you got that removed. It, it turned out okay. Most of it. Um, and then T.Y. Hilton has a hamstring injury, e. which is just, you know, coming off an injury plague season, you don't like to see it. No, no it's bad and, momentum. And it was, you know, last year. They say it was it's the, minor, but. Yeah, but, it, you know, the soft tissue leg issues last year that hampered him. Now you've got it happening again, heading into, you know, a preseasonless season. I, I don't like this at, at all. It, it definitely puts up a red flag for me when I'm staring at T.Y. Hilton and other players. Uh, he's been one of those 50-50 guys where I'm like, oh, I kind of like the value here, but there's other players right there I like. I'll probably... You know, if he doesn't drop an ADP, I would choose the other players. I'm gonna, I'm willing to hold out judgment for a little while here till we see if he's on the field to begin camp. But no, it's not good. He's always got something going on. He's always just getting over something or about to start something new. So it's concerning. Any other news you guys want to talk about? No. All right. Before we get into our main segment today, I do want to take a second and uh, remind everybody about the Ultimate Draft Kit. It's available right now. You get access to the uh, 100 plus video player profiles. We've got tons of new features this year. You can check them all out at ultimatedraftkit.com. You get access to the app. So you can use it on your computer. You can use it on your phone. We've got uh, updates all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jeremy Hill is really, really <laughs> high in Mike's rankings, which you can see. RB number one. RB1, um, ultimatedraftkit.com for that. Very excited about, uh, you know, just helping you prepare for your draft. Set that foundation for your year. And maybe you waited a little while because you didn't know if we'd have a season, and now you've got to get ready because your Zoom draft is coming up. Mm. That's what we're doing. We got the Zoom draft. That's right. And uh, you can get ready at ultimatedraftkit.com. And make sure you check out fantasychamps.com. People ask, where do you go for your, your trophies, your rings? Because, look, what... It's all about celebrating mm. when you are a champ. A champ needs to champ. Yeah. And the only place you should be doing that is fantasychamps.com. Rings, trophies, belts. Oh, my. A bunch of uh, amazing things. Uh, I mean, our, our trophy shelves here are stocked with gear from Fantasy Champs. And if you use the code BALLERS on checkout, you're going to save a little bit of money. Fantasychamps.com. Ice and fire. That's the part of the show where people hit the back 30 seconds button three or four times. Welcome in to Ice and Fire for 2020. We have each selected one ice, one fire pick for the upcoming season. One bust, one breakout. And uh, who wants to kick it off? I guess we're starting with ice Ooh, because the drop tells me here. we need to do that. Well, the, the segment's called Ice and Fire. Yeah, yeah. I, can, I can start it off. 
All right. Let's All right. It. Well, we'll start it off. We were just talking about Jarvis Landry. Let's talk about a teammate of his, a man that got the bag, Austin Hooper. Mm. Last year's tight end at number one through the first half of the season, and not just the tight end one. He was dominant. Travis Kelsey was the tight end two, number two through that first half of the season at 11.7 fantasy points a game. Austin Hooper was up at 14.6. Yeah, we had, forget about how nice that run was. He was awesome. Uh, came back. Uh, that, that, that was exactly when he was injured after week eight and then came back, struggled with a little bit of injury. But, you know, parlayed that into signing the richest tight end contract at that point in the in the NFL. He was the highest paid tight end. He's being drafted as a tight end one right now in fantasy drafts. And the Foot Clan, I'm telling you, stay away. It's fool's gold. <laughs> it's not. I, ice bath for Austin <laughs> Hooper. Ice Ooh. bath for Austin Hooper. Here's why I am down on Austin Hooper. First of all, as a player, he is an above average tight end. He's all right. He's he's pretty good. The Browns think he's pretty good. They do. But, I mean, this is a guy who's a, a, a third-round NFL draft pick, a 59th percentile athlete, um, a guy who, before this last season, his highest yardage total in his career was 660. His highest touchdown total, that's where tight ends really make their hay, right? Fantasy. His highest touchdown total in a season was four before this mm. last season. Uh, and that includes multiple 16 game seasons. So, so why was he so great to start last year? Well, it's simple fantasy football math. It's, it's opportunity. He ran the most routes in the league at tight end, 36.7 routes per game. That was number one. So he was running, he was on the field looking for the ball more than Kittle, more than Kelsey, more than everyone. That's what number one means <laughs> that he had the most. Sure. Um, and if you look at, I don't know, say Kyle Rudolph the tight end one for the head coach that is now the coach of the Browns. He only ran 22.4 routes per game. Why did he only run 22.4? Well, because he wasn't the only guy running routes at tight end. Irv Smith, their rookie last year, ran 19 routes per game. So these are guys that, you know, the, the tight end position was important. That's why they went out and paid him. But their system runs multiple tight ends uh, you know, at different times there, which I think is a good strategy. But my point is last year as a Falcon, Austin Hooper was successful for fantasy because he was running routes nonstop. And not only was he running routes nonstop, but he was running routes nonstop for the team that threw the ball the most. The Falcons threw the ball 684 times. Last year, the Browns only threw the ball 539 times, 145 fewer targets, and so if you give him the same percentage of routes run, and, you, and he's the man, but you take away 145 targets from the team, he's not going to be that great. But, of course, that was the Browns, new head coaching team coming in uh, from the Minnesota Vikings where they threw the ball 466 right. times, yeah. 218 fewer targets. This team is not going to throw the ball as much, and they are going to split the tight end workload with David and Joku, who requested a trade. And what did the Browns say? They said, no, we're we're really planning on using you. And, and he unrequested it this week. Yeah, I mean. Did you see that? I did not see that. It's yeah. probably because he Never got, happened. He, yeah, he said he's <laughs> super excited to be in Cleveland. <laughs> I mean, I'm guessing it's because Total he's fabrication. like. Total <laughs> fabrication. Complete lie. <laughs> um, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be on the field running routes a lot on this scheme. So if you take. Austin Hooper, who's just an average or, or above average talent, yeah. but he's not a he's you, not a you dominant. Don't, you, don't, you don't need to poo poo the player. R well, you just don't like him for fantasy right now. My point is, he's not a super. You know, Kittle Athle athletically, David Njoku is far superior than Austin Hooper. Hooper is uh, is the more reliable. He's the Jason Witten in today's NFL. He's exceptionally reliable. He became a best friend to Matt Ryan in terms of just. You can throw the ball to him 10 yards away, and he's going to catch it uh, 75 times a year. Yeah. But he's not somebody that's going to go take fewer targets, you're making the argument, that, and then still offer you that high-end production because his yards per catch is low, I mean, compared to some of the bigger... Well, he's not one of those guys that breaks a tackle and runs for 80 yards. He's not Kittle. Exactly. So uh, I, I just don't see any upside with Austin Hooper. Uh, I, I can't fathom him paying off in fantasy and being someone that you really, really like week in and week out. Judge, you should grab some uh, 
ADPs on these guys so that we can reference them. Because I'm, I'm curious where Austin Hooper is. He's one of the players that more frequently gets asked about in terms of us being down on him. And I believe he is in our UDK as a, you know, as a bust pick. And so I'm on board with this argument. I just don't think there's going to be the opportunity outside of Beckham and Landry being hurt and them having to build the passing offense around Austin Hooper of repeating what he did last year. Austin Hooper is currently the tight end 10 uh, on Yahoo, the tight end 11. So he's being drafted as a starter for fantasy. Right. All right, I'm going to hand the ball off to Mike. Well, speaking of handoffs, I want to bring up a running back that I have cooled on tremendously. Uh, I'm not drafting him anywhere. Look, I, I get it. The name power is mighty from Todd Gurley, the new starting running back for the Atlanta Falcons. I get it. I want Todd Gurley to be good. I want him to be great for fantasy. I'm not projecting that, though. Here is what has happened over the course of Todd Gurley's career. In 2016, the sophomore year, Gurley's coming off a great rookie season. The breakout is imminent. Everyone's taking Todd Gurley with the second over or first overall pick in fantasy drafts. His offensive line that year ranked 29th, and Todd Gurley put up 885 rushing yards. It was an absolute catastrophe, a bust of a season. Now, the people who stuck with it, they they choose to ride or die with Todd Gurley. Sean McVay came in. He fixed that offensive lineup. They were ranked third. Their offensive line was ranked third in 2017. Todd Gurley responds with over 1,300 rushing yards. Follows it up the next year with 1,250 rushing yards because he has the number one offensive line in the league. Last year, the offensive line completely crumbles what else crumbles? Todd Gurley's rushing numbers. He drops to 857 rushing yards, a 400 rushing yard drop. The offensive line could not block what he needed to get open. There's all the talk of Todd Gurley's arthritic knee. Yeah, I was going to say, do you almost feel like the injury was overemphasized relative to these type of... I'm just saying it's definitely... like I hadn't even gotten to that part of the argument of the team was... Uh, was the team chose not to go all out with Todd Gurley last year. I mean, he was he was still getting opportunity, but the efficiency absolutely collapsed. Now he goes to the Atlanta Falcons, where the last two years, their offensive line has ranked 24th. That's not a great situation. They do have a couple pieces who are interesting, but Pro Football Focus is projecting them as the 24th best offensive line. So Todd Gurley is not walking into a great situation. Todd Gurley also, like he was, he could be limping into a great situation. He could be limping with one good knee. I see what you did there. <laughs> Let's talk about red zone opportunity because Todd Gurley was still fine for fantasy football with his 850 rushing yards because the dude was scoring absolutely nonstop, and that's because last year the Rams had 18 carries at the running back position inside the five. Atlanta, ten. Two years ago, the Rams had 20 carries inside the five. Atlanta, oh wait, still 10. <laughs> They're not getting opportunities to the running back position inside the five. Like, What has happened to Todd Gurley? The Rams know something. The Rams did not want to pay him. Like They, they could have kept Todd Gurley forever. He was under contract. They're but, paying him still. And they said, nah, man, you, uh, we need you off the team. You're better for our team if you aren't on it anymore. <laughs> and look. The, the the receptions. Here's where things are, are really crazy to me. The receptions. The, we know that the receptions uh, absolutely plummeted, but Todd Gurley was still on the field. Last year, he ran the four or tied with the fourth most routes run at the running back position. He was out there. And his receiving rank from Pro Football Focus 132 out of a. I, I, I'm sorry. 132nd best oh, yeah. out of 137 running backs. Or the big headline. That is behind Kalen Balaj, the dude who has the circus video of him being scared to catch the ball, being, being brick hands. That's how Pro Football Focus graded out Todd Gurley's receiving grade. Things have absolutely plummeted for for Gurley. And like I said, he was out there, 391 routes run, only 49 targets. To put that in perspective, he was running very similar routes 
the past couple years for Sean McVay when he was getting 81 targets, 87 targets. The team decided, Jared Goff decided, I'm not going to throw the ball to Todd Gurley. I don't like what is happening when I throw him the ball. So I am very concerned about the player. The situation is not great. Yeah, he's the lead back. He'll see opportunity. But you want to know something interesting that I'm I just, very concerned. I just glanced. I wanted to see how the fantasy community valued Devontae Freeman in this offense last year. He has the identical draft position that Todd Gurley does right now. Mm. Last year? Last year. He was the fifth pick of the third round. Todd Gurley's current ADP is the fifth pick of the third round. Oh, my goodness. Seriously? Yeah. So it's interesting, like, looking at year over year, Devonta Freeman last. Because I was kind of wondering, like, are we getting the name recognition bump for ADP-wise with Gurley? And I actually think, you know, certain players, we, we reference, maybe this is a good time to talk about it, we reference average draft position on the show a lot, which is a conglomeration, an average of every single right. mock draft taking place over a recent amount of time. That doesn't mean that's going to happen in your league, and it's very important for you to understand. Todd Gurley's the kind of player that I think will have a wider variance than other players in terms of in one league, he's going to be a second-round pick. In another league, he might be a fourth-round pick because he's been at the forefront of the fantasy community for so long. He's got a big name, big production, won people leagues, lost people leagues, hurt knee, not hurt knee. He may not go in this range, but you know, you bring up some very important points. I've always thought this offseason, he's just not going to get as much of the work as you know we want him to as fantasy Well, that would be even worse. Exactly. I mean, like if Brian Hill, who, you know, recently they've said they believed he had he should have an opportunity in the offense. If he gets a little bit of extra work, it's going to make it difficult for Gurley to return draft value unless that offensive line takes a step forward because then you might make the argument that efficiency will rise. Yeah, I, I have been more on, more positive towards Todd Gurley, and my argument for that is the fact that what he lost last year was the receiving work that made Todd Gurley so valuable. A reception is worth so much more in fantasy football than sure. a carry. And he didn't get the targets and the receptions that Todd Gurley should or Todd Gurley of old has. Um, or had. any other running back running that amount of routes. Absolutely. And so <laughs> when I look at how much, you know, over the course of, uh, you know, Devon Freeman's career, he's been involved in the passing game, how many vacated targets for Atlanta, the passing opportunity for Todd Gurley in Atlanta is what has excited me. Looking deeper, as you have, at the fact that he was running the routes, he was involved, he just wasn't good. Well, it's you hard, to, hard to know who, the, who to blame, though. But at least we know that the blame can be his. If if he's not out there running routes and they schemed him away and they just decided we need more blockers in and you know or or, or whatever the case is, then we say, well, Gurley's going to have more opportunity here. But he had the opportunity last year and didn't come through in the receiving game. Whether that's just getting you know to a to a break on a route quicker um, and he doesn't get there and so he's not the read. That scares me a little bit more, and and certainly when I when I saw this breakdown, it it, it makes me rethink my girly love. Where are you comfortable with him, Mike? Is, uh, is he a, a, yeah. four, a fourth round running back no. instead of a third round running he back? He is. He's not a fourth round running back for me either. That's what I want to say. Like, there is a world where Todd Gurley can be very valuable for your fantasy team. He's just he is an ice pick for me at his current ADP. If he's dropping into I mean, it would have to be a big drop. Let me, so let me probably challenge you because you won't, you won't like the question because it's not going to be easy. All right. Uh, we just talked about McCoy. Ronald Jones <laughs> or Todd Gurley? I, knew, I know it's not going to be a very good no, question for you. That is terrible. I think I would <laughs> I knew it was slightly, a bad one. slightly Todd Gurley. Okay. Wow. I think that's where I am too. Um, speaking of schemes, talking about Gurley, what he did last year, we're going to talk about another tight end to finish out the – ice section i'm it's another ice bath for a tight end and it's almost entirely because this argument needs to be made entirely because of the adp of this player and it's tyler higby um fantasy darling for the back half of the year tight end seven right now in fantasy drafts is he the Hig beast? Or is he the Hig bust? That's what we've got to figure <laughs> oh, out we got to figure that out <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> Jason was a big fan. Uh, 
for Tyler Higby, and you look forward into this season, we've talked a lot about the Rams and what they're going to do on the offense. And I'm going to concede a few points in this argument against Tyler Higby. But it comes down to snaps, opportunity, and then the recency argument for Tyler Higby. His five-game stretch to end the season was outlandishly good. It's, it's historic. It's historically good. That's a good way to put it because I think there's about three or four tight ends that have ever done that over a five-game span. When I look at Tyler Higby, though, it you know how predictive are these five games? This is a player that I think has 63 NFL games in his career. Am I, am I confident enough in Tyler Higby to invest a six-round pick, to make him the tight end seven, based on five games out of 63 in his career? And yes, I can hear you in the back of my head. Tight ends take a while to develop. Tight ends can be featured later on. I see myself as more of like a baritone or Yeah, a that voice is pretty high. But uh, tight ends <laughs> take a while to develop. <laughs> I, just, I, I got needed, you, Mike. I Thank really you. needed the regular Vopo, not my voice uh, or Mike. <laughs> but when you look at what took place, I think you saw a perfect storm at the end of last season that doesn't justify putting him in the top eight tight ends. I understand that the upside was presented to you on the field. Mm -hmm. Last week, I, I brought up the fact, you know, four of the last five games of the season, you had a few things working in Tyler Higby's favor. Like hundreds of receiving yards? Hundreds of receiving yards were working in his favor. <laughs> Available to him because in weeks, you know, 13 through 17, you had basically no Brandon Cooks. You had basically no uh, Gerald Everett. You know, Gerald Everett is the Jordan Reed prototype hand selected by Sean McVay treated as the pass catching back. When you look at what uh, Tyler Higby has done, he succeeded at a far greater level than Gerald Everett in blocking, not being that move tight end, not being that athletic tight end going out and catching the passes. Last year, and you look at snap counts, week one through 12 for Tyler Higby, Tyler Higbeast on the field 35% of the time when Gerald Everett was healthy, when Brandon Cooks was healthy. That week, weeks 13 through 17, all of a sudden you're at 68% of the time he's on the field. We saw the transition to 12 personnel. And here's the point I'm willing to concede. I think you're going to see more of that this year than you did last year. It, it, otherwise, I don't think that this team gives away Brandon Cooks for free. I really don't. I, if they're a three-wide receiver offense, I don't think they give Brandon Cooks away for free. But when you look at targets, I mean, Gerald Everett was gone. You know, this offseason, anecdotal Sean McVay hype talk speak you know, excited about yeah. what Gerald Everett's going to do. I think Tyler Higbee did a phenomenal job, but I think Gerald Everett's a guy that I've got to do a better job of utilizing the skill set on. I think it wasn't at the very end of the year he was back on the field and golf missed him on that route down the sideline to win that last game. Everett? I can picture it, Everett. Yeah, coming down the side of the Maybe. field. Um, he was drafted to be that Reed clone. And so you have to look at it. And to me, I just don't see Higbee as a featured option Week in and week out, once you have Gerald Everett back into this, into the fold, he's the more athletic tight end. And so then you're looking at a two tight end situation. You're looking at target distribution with Cooper Cup, the running backs, uh, Robert Woods, both guys, both wide receivers are going to demand a lot of targets. So my prediction for him is that he is a back end tight end one. He is a high end tight end two range. And Everett pops up to massacre weeks for him. I mean, too frequently for me to draft him at tight end seven. And here's the gap that you see in average draft position. Higby is the seventh or eighth tight end off the board. Gerald Everett's the 35th or 36th tight end off the board. If the argument is this offense is going to move forward with two tight end sets and Gerald Everett has proven, like he did last year in multiple game stretches, to be a good fantasy tight end, why on earth isn't Everett getting any attention in the fantasy community? But he's on the field just as much. Yes. Yeah. But but Higbeast was on pace for 137 <laughs> receptions and yes. 1,670 yards. It's true. It's true. But I don't want to play the five game pace. No. It, your the 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 snap breakdowns and the matchup specificity of those five games says that that is absolutely a mirage. That being said, he did show his team that when involved, right. he can be great. So Against I, four teams that were the dead last in the league at giving up points to tight ends. And it, I will say this. That, they got exploited every week. The Cardinals twice, 49ers, and Seattle. The NFC West starts your tight ends. And that's a good coach. A good coach should see a team as vulnerable and feature 
what you got left. There are certain positions that are easier to stream based on a matchup. Right, like defenses. I love streaming defenses because you know what the bad offenses are. Who throws a bunch of picks? One of the best positions to stream is tight end because those teams that stink at guarding tight end, they stink every week at guarding tight end. It, and so I will say that I, I think I think it's a good point. And um, I like Everett this year. I think it's going to be a one-two punch. And I'm I'm not sure who the one in the one-two punch is. And the just to piggyback on the historic, because uh, here's why I believe in Tyler Higby. I have him ranked right where his positional ADP is. So I'm I'm fine with if you want to take the shot on Tyler Higby on a guy who who in a five game stretch showed he could be a, like the number one overall tight end since the year 2000. Before last year, you had only had three tight ends that had strung together four straight games of 100 yards: Tony Gonzalez. Jimmy Graham, and oh, I'm blanking. Oh, and Travis Kelsey, and now Tyler Higby is in that group. Rob Gronkowski, first ballot Hall of Fame. Rob Gronkowski didn't accomplish that feat. Like, if you give Tyler Higby 11.2 targets per game, which is what he got from weeks 13 through 17, in the offense that threw the ball more than anybody in football, you're going to be fine. If you get the three targets a game when Gerald Everett was active from weeks one through 12. You're going to have wasted your draft pick, and True. it is a shot. You're taking the shot. I, I don't want people to see him as a lock. And when you're tight in seven, you're getting up there. So yeah, that I think that's the issue, right? He's a sixth rounder right now. Um, if if he's dropping to the tenth round, the upside is worth that risk because you know what, whatever. I'm you know, I'm not giving up a valuable running back or wide receiver in round ten. Whereas in round six, there's still some. Some really solid known commodities. Sure. Um, if they're so, running two tight ends with Gerald Everett and Tyler Higby on the field, what do you think that target gap's going to be? Even if you're on the Higby side, I mean, it just seems hard to imagine that they're going to feature one and a the, half. You know, targets a game. <laughs> so all right, it makes. I think that makes a compelling argument for the ignored Gerald Everett, who was a really good tight end for long stretches last week, last year. All right, let's move into the fire picks. Bringing the heat. Who wants to go first? I guess I'm up. Yeah, well, Jason's up. We'll just yeah. keep the keep the order going. No guff. <laughs> no uh, guff. All right. Oh, well, no guff. <laughs> Look, uh, there was some recent coach speak about this player, um, and I am I am catching can fire. I, can I tell you what kind of coach speak it yeah. was, real quick? Yeah. It was, the, the it was the kind that made me go in the dynasty league where I traded this player. <laughs> And make a couple of real piss poor efforts to get him back. Mm. Just some real junk offers, just to just to assuage my conscience for trading him away. Yeah, and the and the him is Miles Sanders. I am uh, getting a little hot and bothered. The fire is coming in my belly for Miles <laughs> Sanders because this coach speak. Look, our job. You listen to the show in part. I mean, for for many many reasons. Number one to win championships. Number mm. two to nope. enjoy three fantasy no football. guff. Three no guff and four decipher coach speak because a lot of times coach speak is really really stupid. And this coach speak, which, Frank Reich disagrees with you, but go on. Uh, Deuce Staley, the running back coach um, uh, for the Philadelphia Eagles, was basically saying he's excited about him handling the 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 full workload. That was the coach speak, and so I have three reasons. Why I 100% believe the coach speak. Reason number one, specificity. I went and watched the interview. I didn't just look at the headline. I watched him talk about him. And when he was talking about Miles Sanders saying, this is a guy that can handle it. He's excited about giving him the, the full workload. He says he doesn't want to limit him to 15 touches. And then he kind of corrects himself. He goes, well, like I don't want to limit him to 15 carries and five passes. He's really specific, saying he doesn't want to limit him to 15 carries and five passes. That limit, that not, you know, you don't want to limit him to there. If they gave him 15 and five, that would be 320 touches. That's what they don't want to limit him to. Here's the players with 320 touches last year. Christian McCaffrey, Ezekiel Elliott, Leonard Fournette, Nick Chubb, Derrick Henry. All top 10 fantasy options, three top five. That's a lot of touches. Yes. That's what they don't want to limit him to. Now, of course, he's just, you know, talking off the, the you know, 
uh, off the cuff. And so I'm not sitting there thinking he did some math on, uh, you know, his little pad there and came up with these specific numbers. But let's talk about reason number two, why I believe this coach speak. Uh, we've already seen it. Th- this right. is, I mean, last year you, you had after the buy, which was right in the middle of the season and excluding the final game of the season, because in the, in the final game of the season, he got hurt. Got hurt. Yep. Uh, he, he didn't play past midway through the second. Um, and he was fine enough. He came back, played the next week in the playoff, 76%. So during that stretch of almost half the season, he was on pace for 250 carries and 83 targets. That's 333 opportunities per game. So we've, this is coach speak saying that 320 touches is what they don't want to limit him to. And when he was the guy last year, they already were giving him those touches. So this, this isn't really coach speak all that much. And reason number three, the depth chart. You have Boston Scott, who he's he's okay. He's yeah. but he's fine. Uh, uh, working against him, he is Boston Scott. Right. He's the sixth round Boston Scott that was cut from the Saints, a practice squad guy that only got the opportunity after all the injuries in, in Philadelphia. I, now he showed he I was. I can't fun. believe you're besmirching Boston no, I, Scott. I, oh, right he, gets, now. he gets all the credit in the world for being the best Boston he Scott is he can the be. The best Boston Scott he can be. And I like Boston he, Scott enough. He's a good pass catching yeah, running back. He's valuable. But he was there last year during this 333 touch pace for uh, for Miles Sanders. Uh, who who else is there? Corey Clement? Uh, Been there. <laughs> Michael Warren. Like Been the there. depth chart is the reason that I loved Christian McCaffrey a couple years ago. There just was we were like, oh, is he gonna is he going to evolve into the workload? Well, it was like, well, what are the other options? Right. They don't have other options. It's the Leonard really... Fournette plan to success. Exactly, of last season. So those three reasons reasons, the specificity of the coach speak, the depth chart that says, well, we still have to, and the fact that we've already seen it. And my final reason for falling in love, here's a list for running backs who have had at least 800 rushing yards and 500 receiving yards as a rookie. Yeah, I know that list. Since the year 2000. That's as far back as my data uh, goes. <laughs> yeah, I know that list. Sa- Saquon Barkley, Miles Sanders, end of list. That's, that's, a, that's a good list to be on. That's a good list. He had a really good rookie year, and now he's being built up as the – look – there's no doubt he is 100% a workhorse back. He is a every down back for fantasy football this year. And he's talented. He's very athletic. He's capable. So uh, I am I am in love with Miles Sanders' upside. And I think his floor with those touches is very safe. So I I mean, I'm I I I think I might take him over my Kenyon Drake. I was gonna say, let, let's figure out where you have the, where the heart, where the fluttering, the, the heart has swollen. Mm-hmm. So let's see where we are. Will you be drafting Miles Sanders or? Let's, okay, easy one. Kenyon Drake. You just said you'll you'll take. S- uh, I uh, that that is the toughest one, but okay, uh, it's a coin flip. The, Miles I see them Sanders the or Josh Jacobs. Miles Sanders. Aaron Jones. Miles Sanders. Derek Henry. Probably Derrick Henry. Okay, so that's that's where the line is. If right it's now? full PPR, Miles Sanders. If it's right. half PPR or standard, Derrick Henry. This feels like one of those situations where, like, we have all of our internal, like, our UDK rankings and our projections, and we have to work some, you know, systems in the back to stop a guy from moving him too fast. Like, we have to have like a little warning bell go off. <laughs> mm-hmm. We've checked. Are the balances you sure? On the show. Are you sure? No, uh, music to my ears. I mean, this is I, – I believe that this team is willing to give the workhorse role to a running back that deserves it. Right. And that that's all it comes down to. I mean, they just like Cam Newton was willing to throw the football to a running back that could catch it. You know, sometimes you force the issue, and Miles, I, I've got no complaints with what you're saying other than the fact that this team seems to go through four phases every year of different offensive line, yeah. quarterback play, injuries – it's a little bit of a bumpy ride with Philadelphia predicting. Oh, it was a bumpy ride for Miles Sanders this, the, the whole offseason. So if you stay true. Carlos Hyde, Devontae and, Freeman, and all these. believed yeah. then and McCoy, uh, if you just believed in Miles Sanders, look, it worked out. Well, I mean, look. As of now. I moved him in a league because I was trying to play the gamble that the rumors about adding another piece. I want to trade the hype of Miles right. Sanders before the, the acquisition of a Carlos Hyde that might kind of siphon off a little bit of the opportunity. Oh, it definitely would have. And I lost that. 
So, it looks like it. All possibly. right. Uh, my fire pick, uh, and Andy was already trying to douse the flames of this player at the beginning of the show, but it doesn't matter to me because- Was I? You, uh, I thought you were. No. You, well, you I mean, I doused I, maybe all the time. Okay. Well, <laughs> but not specifically this show. Maybe all the time. Well, you were talking about Jarvis. And, I said I wanted Jarvis on the field for a, a Beckham bounce back, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. So it's Odell Beckham, wide receiver for the Cleveland Browns. Look, the- I can't wait to hear this. I don't love his AD. I'll be honest. I don't love the ADP, but I want to lay out the case. I think Odell Beckham will be back. And here is why. It was a terrible year for Odell Beckham, who still hit over 1,000 receiving yards, by the way, but it was his lowest yards per game by 20 yards. Like you saw a massive dip in production. His catch rate was a career 62.75%. The catch rate plummeted down to Andy, 55%. 55%. Uh, thank you. Now, look, uh, let's let's take a, a deeper look at Odell Beckham, the player. Reception perception, uh, it's, it's how Matt Harmon charts players. He looks at wide receivers. We have that data exclusively available in the, in the Ultimate Draft Kit. He has graded out Odell Beckham. Always positive. He, Odell Beckham has crushed this system. He has never finished below the 98th percentile versus press coverage. So you want to you want to bump on Odell Beckham? He is in the top two percent. He is getting open. It's a stupid thing to run press coverage against him. Last year, from the top two percent, he fell to the 45th percentile. Like that is that is an unbelievable drop. Which look to me that says something very specifically that if you're putting your hands on Beckham, he's not. Something is missing. And then Matt Harmon's uh, assessment was it was so pronounced, his drop, you have to conclude that Beckham simply was not healthy at any point in 2019. And here is a quote that I, I missed from December. Beckham said, I've been banged up all year since whatever happened in camp. Odo Beckham was on the injury report every single week. We just did not realize how bad this training camp injury actually was. It was a core injury. He had to go and get it repaired, which he has he has done in the offseason. Odell Beckham's going to be 100%. Yeah, he said 100% healthy now. Jarvis may not be. What was interesting of when I was looking back for Odell, Jarvis wasn't going to have surgery. Like That was kind of the decision, and then a little bit later on, they clearly changed Did their Beckham minds. Did Beckham say, no, you should do this? <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, and, and then let's look at the other opportunity. The, who's throwing him the ball? So... I believe that Baker Mayfield, I believe he can bounce back with Kevin Stefanski as his head coach. Freddie Kitchens was an absolute failure. We saw Odo Beckham's deep completion percentage, his adjusted completion percentage, drop 10% in, from his rookie year to last year. His regular completion percentage dropped by, by five whole points. The offensive line has been rebuilt. Going into the season, Pro Football Focus is projecting them as the number six offensive line headed into the season. You have a new OC, Alex Van Pelt, who is a former quarterback. He is a quarterback coach. He was the quarterback coach for Aaron Rodgers when Aaron Rodgers had his MVP season. Not saying you give the, all the credit to the quarterback coach, but that certainly helps that the OC, his, uh, his main focus is fixing Baker Mayfield. And then something that I thought was, you know, it's, it's at least interesting, was Kirk Cousins, saw his clean dropbacks improve from 61% of the time he had a, a clean pocket. That jumped all the way up to 69% under the Kevin Stefanski two tight end offense. He put emphasis on protecting Kirk Cousins. Nice. I think Baker oh, needs it. I really think that this system is set up so perfectly for Baker to bounce back, which, by the way, we've, we've seen Baker as a starting quarterback basically, you know, the five years, his, his two pro years, and then his three years as Oklahoma, I'm – I'm ignoring the the Texas year. He was great every single time he's been on a football field, including his rookie year. We've seen him be terrible once, and I think there are uh, very specific reasons for things being terrible. Part of it is Baker's fault, but I'm putting a lot of blame on what the the coaching or the, the management of Cleveland did to that team last year. Well, I, I think the one question people have about how good Baker can be is. You know, Kirk Cousins is great, but it might not equate 
It might equate to success on the field. It might not equate to the fantasy side. How do you approach that when you say, look, Kirk Cousins is arguably, I mean, I, I was tweeting about it all year. He was the best quarterback in football. Yeah, Kirk Cousins on, is, uh, by several metrics in the Stefanski offense. It didn't you, matter for fantasy. You're saying so just Baker's, Baker's fantasy output? I'm saying you could be 100% right on Baker and still not get fantasy output from him. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. And that's fair. I'm, this is not me making the case that, oh, that, that Baker Mayfield is going to be a top 12 quarterback or, or a, anything like that. I'm just saying – I really believe that Odell Beckham was hurt far worse than anybody knew. That's interesting. It happened in training camp. Right. And he looked, And then it showed up on reception perception. Like the the dude has been elite. Not just great. He has been elite since he came into the league. And I don't think he is done. When when I watched them play, it always seemed like Odell Beckham and Baker Mayfield were completely out of sync. I mean, always. Right. Every play it seemed like he's he's like you said, Andy, is well, the injury can't cause him to throw the ball eight yards away from him. But maybe that's where oh, Beckham would have... It was probably both. I mean, it was probably both both situations. Because he wasn't bad throwing the ball to Jarvis. Ba Baker was getting, well, yeah, closer line of scrimmage, I'm sure. But Baker was getting hammered, and then Beckham was hurt. It was not a good situation. Right. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, he's being drafted as the wide receiver nine. Yeah, like, why you like brought I up said, the ADP. It, the ADP is not the best, but... If he if last year if that was just health and he's healthy this year, I mean Odo Beckham should at least return ADP value it, with upside of being the number one guy. All right, last pick here, my fire pick, not going as the wide receiver nine, going as the wide receiver twenty eight. You are all in, man, all in. AJ Green. <laughs> So push the chips. It's the price. Push them in. Look, you don't look. The amount of chips I got to push in for AJ Green isn't a lot. It's not the Beckham chips anymore. They I mean, were lost. On, I was the, you, the chips you lost, lost all the chips done. on AJ Green last year. <laughs> which, which again, this is why he's in the seventh and eighth round. My argument for AJ Green uh, this year as a fire pick is is price. So average draft position is a factor and productivity. Make peace with this statement. A.J. Green is a fragile player. Make peace with this. If you draft A.J. Green, you're drafting a fragile player. You're 100% buying a fragile player. That's step one in the A.J. Green uh, argument. But if you go beyond buying a fragile player, he's been an unstoppable force in the National Football League for the previous 111 games he's played as an NFL wide receiver. There has been no decline in any way, shape, or form of his on-the-field performance. You, you know, we talk about Mike Evans hitting that six-year, thousand-yard mark. A.J. Green would have had a seven-year stretch to start his career, except for he hit 964 on a 10-game season. So he would have had seven straight years. Last time he was on the field, he was on 130 target, 80 catch, 1,200-yard, 10-touchdown pace, also known as all the stat lines A.J. Green always puts up when he's on the field. You get into the more anecdotal narrative street arguments. Do you know what it costs? To franchise a wide receiver in the NFL? A lot. A lot $17.8 million. This is a team that we talk all about. Oh, Joe Burrow, the future. T. Higgins, the future. Zach Taylor, the future. We're looking to the future. You don't, this is a, a tight wad franchise. You're going to drop $17.8 million on a player that didn't play last year? That sounds like them saying, we hear you, Andy. We still believe AJ. <laughs> we still believe AJ. Green. Well, we were actually going to move on, but then there was this podcast that is I heard. Is a difference maker. Well, he's telling me. They're telling me <laughs> they believe that he's still a difference maker. He's talked about loving the Zach Taylor offense, that he could play a long time in this offense. It facilitates a longer career for him. And if you look at AJ Green, we know what he is athletically. He's never been a burner. You look at the kind of Larry Fitzgerald career extension arc. That's the kind of thing I can apply to a, a player like A.J. Green. Um, Zach Taylor coming out, he's going to be a huge part of this offense and the team. Everything we define as a Bengal is what A.J. is. You worried about the quarterback play? Allen Robinson has Mitch Trubisky. D.J. Mm -hmm. Moore has Teddy Bridgewater. Devontae Parker has insert quarterback here. One Ter of them. Terry McLaurin has insert quarterback here. Dwayne right. Haskins, maybe Alex Smith coming back. All those players are way above... A.J. Green, an average draft position. Joe Burrow can sling it. He's coming in with arguably the the most compelling single-season collegiate quarterback resume of any rookie quarterback in the last 15 years. So my whole, my whole argument here is you're not getting – A.J. Green will not be what his ADP is. He yes. may be – you might lose the chips. You're buying a fragile player. 
he could get hurt again. But know what he did? He didn't come back. He didn't force himself back from the injuries. He just waited and got better. And he's like Odell Beckham on paper right now from the coaching staff, 100% healthy. You're not going to get wide receiver 28 to 32. You're going to get much, much above that. Or you're going to get, as Jason said, you're going to find that treasure chest on the beach. You're going to open it up. There's nothing inside. Maybe some crabs. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you, you want. never want crabs. You never no. want crabs. Uh, and, you know, I think your best <laughs> argument here is is the price, is the fact that yeah. you're taking a yep. high. I'm in. Uh, you're taking a, a high upside pick at a place where if you're wrong, it's not the end of the world. It, you know, I, look, I want my seventh rounder. I want him to come through, but it's not like you're giving up your first or second round pick to get A.J. Green, so you're taking your shot. I'm probably still out, but I don't mind it. You know, l last year I was I was very anti-A.J. Green. Um, this year I personally will probably try to avoid it. He's 32 let years me, old. Let me ask you a question because you brought up T.Y. Hilton at the top. I just want to put you on the spot here. Yeah. Late third round, T.Y. Hilton, middle seventh round, A.J. Green. What are you picking? If if this, So if this was a keeper league and I could choose to grab yeah, one of like those two players, up, trade that's, a the, great, that's a great question. I'm just curious. I'm, I'll am i probably take – ooh, that is tough. I think A.J. Green and in the seventh and having a fourth round pick available to grab someone else in the fourth – with T.Y. Hilton's, oh, the third? Yeah, I think I'd go A.J. Green there. I have Green ranked higher. There you go. It's easy for Mike. Yep. All right. Well, uh, ice and fire in the books, guys. Mm, we made it. We've got a mock draft show coming up Morning this week. Morning show. We've we got did episodes it. every single day. Do us a favor. Subscribe to the podcast. Click that subscribe button, whether it's Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Spotify. Podcasts, Spotify. Uh, click that subscribe button. Wait. It's completely free, Jay. You said do us a favor. I'm gonna. Ch I'm gonna do yourself. It. A do favor. yourself a Thank favor. You. Click that subscribe button. You're welcome. It's our guff free promise. Yeah. Okay. And we're gonna answer a ton of questions again this week. Get you ready for the 2020 fantasy football season. Uh, we want to thank Pristine Auction Auction for sponsoring the show. It is Pristine Week through August 6th. Hmm. Listen to this. One hundred thousand dollars in giveaways. At Pristine Auction, just yeah, that's this a lot week. of giveaways. We know, we know the people there, and even internally, there some people are like, are "Why you, are we doing? There's too much. Why are, are you sure you want to do this? Yeah, that's just not. I mean, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, but it's great. If you, you go get to, in. there's a special code for this week. If you go to pristineauction.com, use the code PW2020. So Pristine Week, PW2020. You get ten dollars off your first item. There's one hundred thousand dollars in giveaways. At pristineauction.com, use the code PW2020. That was fun. Indeed. We should do another show, and we should do it tomorrow. I agree. I'm After in. After my nap. <laughs> all right. See you all tomorrow. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com. And follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.